Thanks, Andy, and thanks all the organising people, and thanks for being a fantastic audience. I'm, it's great to see so many people interested in declarative languages. It makes uh, people like myself who've, who are academics studying declarative languages and doing research and teaching people, it um, makes us feel a lot better when we see an audience this big and, you know, run into ex-students from years and years ago who say nice things about you, so, you know. <laughs> um, so the, the original advertised title of this, I started looking at it and it got more and more horrible in my mind. It looks like academic gobbledygook. So I've uh, got an alternative title, which I think is much nicer. And there are a couple of co-authors. Um, Bernie's around somewhere, I think. Anyway, so it's not just my uh, silly ideas. Um, <clears throat> so what am I going to be talking about? The, the core of this talk and the core of my research as an academic computer scientist over many, many years is trying to think a little bit more about the relationship between three things. The, the first one is our intentions, what goes on in our, in our head, what do we want this computer system to do. The second one is the programs that we write, so they're syntactic objects, uh, something fairly simple, and you can nail it down and, you know, print it out, something solid, and what the computer actually does with them. So that's some sort of process. So, so one thing is sort of something a bit weird inside our head, which is very hard to nail down, programs, which are fairly simple to nail down, and um, what gets computed. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about one way of trying to reconcile those three things, some sort of model that tries to relate them. It's got a few problems. Uh, it's a little bit overly simplistic, um, so I'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> that's to do with uh, something that, that people have known about for a long time, things to do with infinite loops, for example, and how there's a difference between simple, nice mathematics and what happens when you try to put things on a computer. But there's another problem, um, which is under specification, and that's the difference between what's in our head and some nice mathematics. And that's received a lot less attention, and so that's sort of the, the main novel kind of stuff that we're dealing with. And it turns out that you can do a little bit of tweaking of this uh, framework, and it all works out. At least that's what we think. As an aside, there's a whole lot of mathematics behind this, and some of that actually hasn't been done yet. One of the reasons why I propose this talk is to try to move this along a bit. Um, Hopefully there are some, you know, solid theorems, etc., which we can write up as an academic paper at some point. So here are those three different things. Um, the top left is uh, meant to be a brain. It looks a bit dodgy because it's actually a picture of my brain, uh, not quite as good as it used to be. So what happens when we do programming? We start off with some sort of intention for what we want the computer to do. Um, we write a program. As we do that, the program has some structure, so it's maybe got a whole lot of different functions. There's some intention that we have behind each one of those functions. Um, so as we do programming, as we build a program, our intentions get refined and expanded. Eventually, we end up with a program in some programming language. Typically, we compile it or interpret it or, or whatever. Somehow, it gets to run on a computer. We get a computation. Most commonly now, we have electronic computers, um, but exactly the same principles applied back in the days of Babbage. Um, so, you know, the, <clears throat> the fundamentals haven't really changed. And then we might have some sort of validation step to make sure that, you know, we are actually computing what we want. And that's all well and good. A lot of the time, people don't think too much about the relationships between these things. So, Manuel's great keynote talk, um, you know, <clears throat> he had some ideas, wrote some programs, got things to work, all fantastic. The time when you really think about the relationships are when you have a bug in your program and the validation step fails and you think, you know, how did this program produce that? 
Okay, so the relationship between programs and what they produce is the, the main area, area of programming language semantics, and there's lots of work on that. But the other thing that can happen is you look at your program and you think, um, what actually did I want that function to do? Or what was I thinking when I wrote that? So <clears throat> the stuff about intentions is often sort of left out a little bit. So one of the things I've been trying to do, and with other people as well, is to try to have some sort of model of the relationship between these things and uh, try to explain it. Why do we want to do that? We want to be able to program better, but also we want to develop software tools, um, <coughs> things like debugging systems, um, tools for verification, even compilation, etc. All, all of the sort of tools associated with uh, programming. Okay, so one very simple view of the world that you can get with um, function languages. So here's, here's some Haskell. Here's a little bit of um, literal Haskell. It's the length function. I won't go into all the details. I hope that you can understand Haskell syntax if, if um, you're not familiar with Haskell. Here we've got two equations. So how do we think of the program? You, you can think of it as two mathematical equations describing some intended function. So in my head, I've got a function which maps lists to integers. Okay, that, that's my intention. So I, I think I know what that function is. I can write down two bits of text saying that the length of the empty list is zero and the length of a list with a head x and tail x, x's, sorry, is one plus the length of x's. Those two math mathematical equations are correct descriptions of that function which is inside my head. So that relates intentions to the program. How do we deal with the computation? Well, when you evaluate a, an expression in Haskell or do a computation, the basic step is replacing equals by equals. So we can have an expression like length of the list one, two, empty list. <clears throat> that matches with the left-hand side of, a, of an equation, so it's equal to the stuff on the right, so we can rewrite it. So it's basically a, a rewriting sort of um, system, and we keep rewriting it. There are some primitive operations like plus, we end up with the answer two. Everything's fine. We, we did a computation, and it's correct. So this sort of view you can also use um, to do optimization and transformation. You can have various sort of laws saying this sort of thing equals this sort of thing. So there's an example there with, with map and compose. And it's also, this view of the world is nice for debugging. So one of the things I've done with Bernie, for example, is uh, work on declarative debugging for, for Haskell. Um, if every equation is correct, i.e. it correctly describes that function in my head, then any result that we get out of the computation, assuming we do get a result, assuming it terminates, that's also going to be correct according to our intentions. And that means that if we get an incorrect result computed, one of the equations in the program was wrong. And it turns out that a declarative debugger can find it. So if you give a declarative debugger the program, the expression or, or the computation, um, if you give it the expression, it can reconstruct the computation, and the program intention. So if you give a debugger those three different things, it can figure out what's wrong with the program. So one complicated thing is how you give a debugger your intentions, typically, uh, in the declarative debugging literature, it's called an oracle. Ultimately, often you just get the debugger to ask questions. So here's a little um, <coughs> session with a declarative debugger. S supposing we have a bug in the program, and instead of a zero for the base case, we put in a one. The computation will end up with a three, surprise, surprise. Um, a debugger can ask you these questions. Does length of the list one, two, empty list equal three? No, it doesn't, um, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, it can find the, the bug in your program. 
So simple sort of declarative debugging uh, works well in this framework. Things start going a little bit wrong when um, you realize that programming language functions, that the behavior of a function or a programming language isn't quite the same as these, the simple way that we might think about mathematical functions. So length I thought of as a function which took a list and produced an integer. But if you have a Haskell function which takes a list and produces an integer, it might loop or it might get some pattern match failure or some sort of other error. So <clears throat> you can get these problems with this divergence between the nice simple mathematical view and what actually happens when you start computing. There's a paper entitled Fast and Loose Reasoning is Morally Correct, which points out some of these errors and the fact that some laws that you might think are true don't actually work when you have um, undefinedness in, in this context. But you can sort of get away with it, um, mostly. So I, just as an aside, at the end of the slides, there's some further reading which gives um, a few references. So what sort of things can happen? Um, what, what can go wrong if you use this sort of naive, naive view of um, equational reasoning? Here's um, some very simple code for x equals bar of x, and we don't care how bar of x is defined. With this sort of very naive view, we can say, well, bar of x and foo of x equal each other, so we can replace one by the other. If we do that in the definition of foo, we get foo of x equals foo of x, which isn't going to compute much. Um, if you look at the functional programming semantics, um, infinite loops, the sort that you get uh, with this, are modeled by a special symbol upside down T pronounced bottom, and that's the bottom value in a, in a partial order. So getting a little bit technical here, I'll, I won't get too technical. <coughs> if you think about it, the equation foo of x equals foo of x, it's consistent with any intention that you might have, but it doesn't give you any information for computing. And so that gives you no information, that's why it sits at the bottom of this sort of ordering. And I'll just give a, a little example of, um, of this ordering. Think of a computation that produces a value of the type maybe bool. Okay, there are three possible values in the type maybe bool, bool shown in green here. There's nothing, there's just false and just true. So that's sort of what our intentions might be. They might be any one of those three values, but when you start writing code to compute this, you might end up with something that loops and doesn't compute anything, so you've got this bottom symbol with no information. There's an intermediate thing where you've got the just data constructor, but you don't have enough information to compute whether it's true or false. So the lines here, the thing above is, um, it means it's got more information than the thing below. So this is sort of well-known stuff in semantics. And that sort of the, the difference between the nice simple mathematics and uh, what happens when you compute it. But the problem of underspecification stems from the fact that there's a difference between what goes on in our head as far as what we intend and the nice simple mathematics. When we, um, so typically when we have um, some function in the code, the intentions that we have are not actually a single mathematical function. So if you think about merge in merge sort, for example, if the arguments are sorted lists, then we know that the result has to be a sorted list and it's got all the, ele all the elements from the input lists. Okay, so that's going to be a function. But if the arguments aren't sorted lists, then typically we don't really care. So when we write merge, uh, we're assuming things are sorted lists. Um, if we feed it garbage, then basically any sort of result is okay. So often we either don't know or don't care or both. And this sort of thing crops up in declarative debugging. You might have a question like, does merge of two lists which aren't sorted equal some other list? Well, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. 
the bottom line is you should never be asking that question. You should never have a computation that has a call like that. And so the, the better debuggers allow this idea of inadmissibility as well as saying, yes, it's true, no, it's not. And people have built such debuggers, like with Bernie, for example. So there are a couple of different forms of specification. One is uh, what I've described with merge, where essentially you have things, um, you can call them preconditions. You have some sort of contract saying, well, I assume that the input looks like this. And if not, then all bets are off. You know, I'm not making any guarantee. And we try to write code such that the preconditions uh, are always satisfied. If not, then the, the code that called our function is buggy. It's not the fault of the merge function if someone calls it in some weird way. But there are other forms of underspecification as well. For example, we can have <coughs> some sort of abstract value where there are multiple ways of representing it, more, more than one concrete Haskell value which represents the same thing. For example, if we have lists represented as, sorry, sets represented as sorted lists but maybe allowed duplicates, then there are multiple representations for the same set. If we call insert of the list 122, um, we might just tack the one on the front um, or we might remove the duplicate um, at the front or we could sort of scan the whole list and remove all the duplicates. The, the answers are all the same set in some sense, but they're different values. So all these different forms of underspe underspecification have implications for how we design declarative debugger oracles. And the, the first one up here has been done. The second one actually hasn't, at least in the debuggers that I know of. So let's see what happens when underspecification and equational reason get together. Um, Here's, again, some very simple code. The, these are curried definitions, so we've got list last. Implicitly, this says list last of x equals last of x. So we're using last and maximum, which are Haskell prelude functions that are built in. Um, and I'm assuming here that where we've got the set functions, set max and the prime version, which the intention is the same, we're only going to be calling those things with sorted lists. Whether they're duplicates or not, doesn't matter. <coughs> so the first equation, so we're defining this, our own version of finding the last element of a list. That's fine, no problems. Set max, it will pass it a sorted list and it'll return the maximum element, which is the maximum element of the set. The third definition up here, We've got <coughs> an alternative version of set max where it just gets the last element of the list. And that's also going to be fine because the list is going to be sorted and so we'll avoid some comparisons. Great, more efficient. The last one, if we think from a, an equational reasoning point of view, the third equation says that set max and list last are equal. So we should be able to just sort of flip the two over and say, well, here's our new version of list last that equals set max. But it doesn't work because that's going to create a precondition violation. And if you look at this little computation down here, if we call list last prime of the list one, two, oh, sorry, two, one, that will call set max with a list which isn't sorted. So this is inadmissible, um, something's dodgy, precondition violation. Um, that gets rewritten to this, ah, problem's gone away, things look good, but we end up with the wrong answer, okay? The intention here is that we should be returning one, but we return two, and the reason is that halfway th through the computation, we violated a precondition. So the equational reasoning went a bit wrong, but it turns out that we can tweak things a little bit so we had equality between those two on either side of those um, the, the functions. So we had four equations. It turns out that equality is not really what we want. Okay, and I'll try to explain it here. The, the relationship between set max and list last up in our head, they're kind of similar, but what we want for set max is actually more flexible. 
because we only need that to work for sorted lists. List last, we need it to always work. So the, what, what we can do is we can think of, um, we can model our intentions by having a set of functions. Okay, we can have the set of functions which are considered correct versions of set max, and that is a superset of the set of functions which is correct for list last. And if we look at those, what used to be four equations, <coughs> it turns out that the ones which were okay, we can put a superset or equal. But the first one, list last, actually equals last. Okay, so it's a, a strict equality. The second one, we've got a strict superset. Set max is the, the set of things which we would consider correct for set max is a superset of the things we'd consider correct for maximum. Same for the third one. For the last one, we don't have that superset or equal relationship. And it turns out, this is the sort of the, the theorem for this paper, which hasn't actually been written yet. Um, <clears throat> if we have greater than or equal to holding for all the equations in our program, then the program is correct. We don't get wrong answers, so we're, we're not worrying about uh, non-termination here. Um, it's partial correctness. So previously I showed some ordering which had some bottoms in it. What you can do is you can basically extend that. Um, so the, the red stuff, uh, sorry, the, the green stuff is what we had before, but we're dealing with sets of things. Um, and we've got this structure down here to do with the difference between the nice pure mathematics and how we can compute stuff. There's a, a little bit of other stuff to do with, you know, things being undefined as far as computing there. The red stuff on top is to do with underspecification. So um, when we don't care at all what we get, we end up with a set of every, every possible value. And Quickly, when you do computing within this ordering, so you've got some expression and you're rewriting it, that's our view of computation, mostly we stay at the same point in that ordering. Okay, we replace equals by equals, so we stay at the same point. Sometimes we go lower in the ordering, and that's okay. You get that with underspecification. If you go sideways, so you might have something which we intend to be may be true and then it goes sideways and becomes maybe false, then that's returning a wrong answer. So that's wrong, you can't go sideways in the ordering. Also, you can't go up. Um, going higher is wrong. If you violate a precondition, you jump right up to the top, okay, meaning anything goes. And if you go up, then the problem is then you can come down again along a different branch, which is essentially going sideways, and that gives you wrong answers. And that's exactly what happened in this computation. The intention here is the answer should be one. We call something where the precondition is violated. So we go right up to the top of this ordering and then we come down a different branch and we get to two. So that's how we got the wrong answer, how you can sort of explain how things went wrong. So in conclusion, Understanding the three different components that I've been talking about, our intentions, our programs, and computations, and the relationships between those, that's really important for our own programming and also for developing tools, tools like debuggers, things like QuickCheck, all the different software tools that, that you might think about. Functional languages and declarative languages in general provide a really fantastic basis for this. Um, if you take the naive equational view, it's not quite right for a couple of reasons, but if you view these things as inequations, then we think everything works out nicely, and so that's sort of the, the way that we should think about our functional programs. So we have a nice, elegant theoretical framework, we have a, a partial order, and this undefined thing, which sits at the bottom, where it means that we can't compute anything, that's at one end of the partial order, but at the other end, there's the I don't know, I don't care thing where nothing is intended. 
questions. There's further reading for people interested. One question at the back there, and one over here. With we'll go to we'll go to Javier first, and then not the back to Joel. Thank you, Lee. Um, so this kind of equational reasoning you need to do because you don't have dependent types. If you had dependent types, or is it the way you can analyze dependent types? Like you can say, not only this function applies to list, but applies to sorted list. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer that well. It, it, I'm the, the view of equational reasoning here is, is a bit sort of oversimplified, probably. Um, and it's it sort of, it's kind of independent of, of the fancy type. So it's just the, the way that you think of your definitions, um, the, the, the meaning you have behind, you know, saying length of the empty list equals zero, for example, or, or f of x equals g of x, H how you view the relationship between f of x and g of x, um, and whether they're equal or I would say one is actually a, a superset of the other in, in some sense, or it's a greater than or equal to relationship instead. Um, I'm not sure if that helps. Maybe, maybe we can discuss it later. Hi. Um, not sure how to ask this question because these ideas are quite new to me, but I wanted to analyse the problem a little bit differently and see if you could comment on it. Um, undefined in these languages, I think you're using it for infinite loop, basically, when, you know, I mean, if we go down to the calculus, you can't normalise. Um, with something like a merge sort where it violates preconditions, it seems like undefinedness is actually in the intention for the function and that the problem that's going on here is that we can't uh, communicate that in the language. So we give a definition for merge sort, which is incorrect when those preconditions are satisfied, but actually those preconditions are violated, but actually we wanted it to be undefined when those preconditions were violated. Um, yeah, I... I I'm, I've spent a long time sort of on, on these sort of issues and at one stage, um, well, I've done a fair bit of work in the logic programming context um, and also the functional context. But what sort of become clear to me, particularly with discussions with Harold, is that there are these two quite distinct notions of undefined. One is undefined from the computing perspective, and the other is undefined from the intentions perspective. And the best way to view this is that they're at opposite ends of the partial order. Um, so, uh, so some of my previous papers, I've um, got the two forms of undefined sort of confused or confounded, um, and that isn't the best way of doing things, I'm, I'm now convinced. So you have this... Um, you, you end up with a complete lattice rather than a, a semi-lattice, and so you've got these two different undefined um, symbols, and they mean different things. One exists in your head, and the other one is to do with what happens in a computer. Excellent. Well, let's uh, thank Lee one more time.